Welcome back to Citizen Podcast. We are at the episode number 15 of this second edition. After the last episode with Jeff from Uganda, where we received a great number of views, we are back in Europe and we have a guest that makes a bean to praline in the Netherlands, the European door of cocoa, where quite all the cocoa that enter in Europe arise from here. Being to bar is an opportunity for a different types of professional profiles. And this time we have a chef that falling in love with being to bar at one of the edition of Chocoa in Amsterdam, the most important exhibition for chocolate makers of Europe. Chovali Chocolate is the name of the brand and we have the pleasure to host Hugh Slinders. Hello guys and welcome back to Shokazon Podcast. Um, we will leave Africa, we leave uh, Uganda uh, and Jaffa with the latitude and uh, we are back in Europe. We are uh, in a country that is, is very important for cacao, for Europe. And uh, we are with uh, Jost Linders of uh, Chovali Chocolate. Hello Jost, how are you? Hi guys, I'm fine. Thank you. Hello, you. Okay. Um, usually, we we ask to our guest to introduce himself by telling uh, how was his life before to to meet chocolate, which is uh, your personal uh, history and uh, what did you do before to to change your life with uh, becoming chocolate maker. So this is uh, your time. Yeah, that's that's okay. Um, I started out as a, as a chef. Uh, that was my uh, training and education for many years. Uh, I've been working in uh, restaurants and catering companies, fine dining, and I always had a great passion for uh, pastry and chocolate, uh, chocolates. Uh, but um, a, a few years ago, like in 2016, I started getting more interested in uh, what is chocolate. I always, you know, you buy the chocolate in a bag and you work with it and I, well, there were some things I didn't really understand about chocolate. So uh, I got introduced on Shokowa, actually, in Amsterdam in 2016, like in February, I think it was. And I saw a whole new world, actually. I never knew uh, what was behind uh, the bag of chocolate and that it was still possible, also possible, to make it yourself and start out really simple. I went on the internet and bought a small launcher from some obscure website in India <laughs> and I tried and play around and I was really surprised by what you could achieve with just uh, a simple machine and, and, a, and a small oven and the results are really nice and I still have a piece of, of that chocolate bar. Now it's getting a little bit less but over the uh, last few years, it started to develop a really nice flavor. Um, so, I, that, yeah, that got my attention and uh, I wanted to know more about the chocolate. And, what, yeah, well, just making a chocolate bar wasn't enough for me. I wanted to um, experiment with more with flavors and bonbons as well. So I started doing uh, courses and uh, more education on pralines and and. Uh, well, the next step was, of course, use my own chocolate for the pralines. And you never see it, actually, or so little chocolatiers in the world use their own chocolate to make pralines. And I still don't know why, but because I think that's the, the best thing you can do. Just create your own couverture and then work down to the pralines, just from the bean to the bonbon, the whole process. So, yeah, that's... Uh, Oh, I got interested in the chocolate and uh, started uh, getting more uh, acquainted with it. And uh, how did you divide it, uh, your, uh, the training part, your experience part on the chocolate between what you learn from uh, uh, classes or from books uh, and the test? How, many, how long uh, did it take for you to test your samples, your chocolate and get to a, a good point for you? Uh, well, that took a long time, actually. Well, the first chocolate I made was good, and but before I could make pralines out of it, I'd have, 
it took quite a while actually because you have to understand how chocolate works and what is chocolate it's because it, it, it's the cocoa mass and the cocoa butter but also you use the sugar and how these compartments are coated within each other to make the viscosity right and you use can use some lecithin and so the whole process was just a lot of failure and error and and trying in a small atelier at home i just had a small separate uh kitchen and i just tiled it up and put an air conditioner in and I just started working my way through the beans and the, the whole process of making pralines and well now i really understand well i think i really understand how uh, the process works and uh, well yeah i'm quite all right now uh, because i sell to restaurants and uh, and and it's still a product um uh, used by chocolate chase uh, or made by chocolate chase the pralines but they still use industrial chocolate they just don't use their own chocolate so i think there's a world to win within the restaurant business in supplying uh, nice pralines so you are producing only pralines or also bars uh i started out with bars but because i'm a chef i just was working with i just was missing the flavors and the, the structures and I think there was a more a bigger challenge for me to make pralines and I definitely will go to the bars as well but I, I just started the other way around I think but I, I will uh, uh, do that uh, the further up this year yeah for sure uh, we never I think we never discussed uh, deeply this point about pralines in the bean to bar because the bean to bar you know chocolate makers usually choose to make bars but the feeling is that at a certain point, the, the ones that are making chocolate, they have been making chocolate since a long time, they uh, find the, the, the need, you know, to express themselves also on other products. And very few of them are entering that, uh, that market too. Uh, can you share with us uh, which are the main uh, uh, problem or issues that you can find uh, combining a chocolate that is kind of a strong chocolate. It's not, uh, you know, the commercial chocolate that it's already flat or doesn't have that personality that the Bintu Bar chocolate has with uh, the feeling of a praline that have a lot of flavors. How do you balance it? Yeah, that's a good question because that was an issue I, uh, I came across as well. Um, when I, I, I made my first couverture or, well, my first chocolate, I used was like a 70%. But just it blew away my, 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 the, the feelings actually, because it was so powerful. So yeah. I think, what, what can I do? So on some internet forum, I had some contact with some chocolate maker in, in the United States and he recommended me just bring the cocoa content down and, and just try to, Conch it out a few hours or some hours longer than you do and just taste and you will notice some of the strong flavors will fade away and it will mellow out a lot more and also when you bring the content down of course yeah can so you, i use now 55 uh, percent okay can, can can you make an example of a good combination of a a bean to bar chocolate with uh, maybe one flavor or more than one flavor of the filling. I don't know, sourness with acidity because it's still too acid, the, the, the bean to bar chocolate usually. Yeah, it, 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 it still is strong. My, my, my flavors are really strong as well. So um, when you buy like chocolates or pralines and they're industrial or made in big factories and you can, you can keep them for months on end because they're just dry fillings. And But my fillings are always fresh, it's like fruit gels and um, fresh, like nuts, uh, janduyas or, or uh, um, uh, fr fresh pralines I make from uh, hazelnuts or walnuts or peking nuts or uh, Iranian pistachios. And, they already have a strong flavor as well. So the pralines I make, they're really 
They're small, they weigh about 12 grams, but they pack a punch. So when you taste them, you just need two bites. It's just a small product. Mm -hmm. And they will stand up to the chocolate. Yeah, that's uh, because the, the, the inside is strong. Any, any idea in the future to mix it with something that comes from your former experience as a chef? I don't know, vegetable, tomato or something like that? I did try that, but it, it's, it's kind of hard. I did use it with parsnip um, <laughs> and white chocolate. It was really nice, but still, um, it didn't go as, you couldn't preserve it as long as I wished. Because still, the, 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 the parts of the vegetables just can't stand the preservation within the chocolate. Or my recipe was just off, probably as well. But it was okay. uh, like two years ago I tried it. But I didn't go for, uh, for vegetables yet. But uh, okay. yeah, I think I, 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 I trained myself. And I, now I really understand what happens inside the fillings. And what you need to do to make the shelf life last longer and what you can and what you can't do. Um, so yeah, I, I get some uh, special uh, orders from restaurants as well to make a certain flavor. So uh, maybe vegetable will be uh, present as well uh, in the near future. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you, Joost, uh, you live in the Netherlands and we know that Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam is uh, one of the biggest uh, a port where the cocoa beans arise and a lot of big companies that produce chocolate uh, uh, buy from. Um, we, how you are used to explain your uh, customers, okay, people that buy your chocolate, the difference between the commercial chocolate and the bean to bar chocolate? Um, I, when, when I try to reach out for new customers or existing customers, uh, especially with new customers, I always take uh, take my pralines as well, just to to taste them. But I always take cocoa beans with it and the nips. Mm -hmm. So that's when I, the first thing I show is the cocoa bean and let them smell cocoa roasted cocoa beans and then smell the nips and taste it. And then I start my story about how chocolate is made. And afterwards, I'll let them taste my pralines. So then they get. A, a small idea of what is chocolate and how is it made and I tell a little bit how the process is done so yeah yeah I think it's it's important to tell the customers um, uh, the difference between um, small craft batch chocolate and commercial chocolate because um, when when you're a small chocolate maker you you, you um, take care of the whole process, so it's the roasting, the sorting, and, 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 and the melanging, and everything else. And in the bigger companies, they, I think they just bulk roast the big batches like containers at once, with sticks and everything inside, and they yeah. do a, a higher roast. And that's why I think um, they sometimes can taste a bit bitter. Um, and well, if you have good quality cocoa beans, it's just no, not necessary to do that high roast. Actually, it's low temperatures from I don't know 110 to 130 degrees should be enough. And they just play around and, and just try and smell and, and taste. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it depends on the cocoa, of course, which origin. And yeah, normally they are normally more easy. It's more easy for the bean to bar chocolate maker to 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 give the the chocolate bars so that uh, it is uh, more easy to, to see the difference. With, uh, with praline, there is the, the ganache inside, and so it is more difficult. So this is a good way to, to explain better. Um, let us know something more about your brand, or your company, and uh, where are you located? How is uh, organized? I'm uh, located in Aalsmeer. Uh, that's uh, like uh, the center of the flowers in Holland. Um, it's a small uh, company and it's actually I started off like early this year, like professionally. So it was always from home in my small separate kitchen. But now I have like a uh, hundred square meters of production separated in um, chocolate making from, uh, from the cocoa bean and an atelier 
uh, where uh, well, where I have my tempering machine and my spray boots and 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 uh, my wine fridge and my workbenches and all the well stick blenders and everything you need to make uh, pr good pralines and uh, yeah, so uh, I think there's a lot of businesses around here and uh, um, I think uh, yeah, there's so many chances for me to to uh, to go around and and try to sell products also. Uh, co uh, um, how do you say that? Um, personalized, like boxes with their logo of the companies, and then a few pralines of me inside, and it's a good rep representative product for the companies. So I see a lot of business opportunities here. Yeah. Can you share with us uh, some of the pralines uh, you are uh, making, and which is the best seller? Yes, please. Okay. Can you explain it, please? Yes, uh, I have here like it's like the after eight. You have the like the mint, mint uh, the mint flavor, like a fondant inside, and uh, a pure ganache of uh, uh, my chocolate. And and which kind of chocolate with it? It's my couvertures, like the fifty-five percent. So 55. it's still a low uh, pure uh, chocolate. And next to it, I make uh, like this one is a banana gel uh, of. But a caramel of banana uh, sit on top of a salted peanut uh, uh, okay. uh This one is my, one of my favorites as well. It's Iranian pistachio and fresh raspberry uh, gel. And okay. here is like a typical Dutch flavor. This um, we call it stroopwafel. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you, if, if you go to a local market here, they they always sell it, and they they bake like it's a fresh flat cookie they bake it in a toasting machine and it's with caramel cream buttery cra caramel cream inside it's really tasty so i made my own praline with that and it really hits uh, the spot and this one is from the made from dutch vanilla it's really vanilla grown here in uh, the greenhouses in uh, oh. in holland and it's amazing quality so i wow. use some local products strangely they make chocolate yeah. Uh, vanilla in Holland, actually, and uh, and you use uh, the same coverture for all these pralines. Yeah, still I use the same coverture. Okay. And uh, yeah, for me it, uh, it works really well. It's made from uh, Eucar um, okay. from the Dominican Republic, and uh -huh. um, yeah, I think it's a consistent quality, and uh, uh, I can always get it. It's of course I pick it up here in Amsterdam in the port, and uh, okay. so it's it's. Do you have to add some extra cocoa butter? Yeah. Okay. Because 55 is very low. Yeah, because I use like a, a, a 32% of or 35% of sugar okay. uh, from Natif uh, Brazil, okay. the organic cane sugar, and uh, uh, the rest is cocoa butter just for the fluidity and a little bit of lecithin as well, because okay. it just gives me a better workability. Uh, it or, would be, I guess, it would be different if you produce um, uh, bars. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I if I'm gonna make bars, and I will eventually this year, it probably will be. I think it will be a, a go and try to make seventy percent. But I think it de depends on the the quality of the cocoa as well. If it's yeah. a good workable or maybe you go for a higher percentage because if you don't want to add cocoa butter you have to use the butter inside the bean so and which is the the combination of praline that uh, it is your best seller um yeah that must be the stroopwafel <laughs> because it's typical from from yeah. from the netherlands i see two layer bonbon is like the, the caramel with a bit a touch of cinnamon and uh dutch stroop stroop is like uh uh, they use on pancakes here in Holland, and there's a cookie bottom inside made of the cookie, which uh, is used in the stroopwafel as well. So it's a two two part uh, bonbon. And which kind of which kind of color uh, do you use for uh, with cocoa butter for cover uh, your pralines? Uh, it's it's just it's food coloring. It's like the powder coloring for uh, non azo uh, coloring. Uh -huh. And you just mix it and uh, then you temper it and you can spray it with an airbrush or use everything, uh, every other technique to uh, give it a nice design and color. Yeah. And uh, when you make a, a new pralines or you make tests, new pralines, 
which is the the process i mean do you have someone that helps you in tasting and gives you some feedbacks or are you by yourself i mean you're a chef you're a chef you're a chocolate maker you decide you don't need anyone else how is the process I, with some flavors of course i did but i also have my son and uh, i get my son and he's really uh, uh well, critical about what i do so I let him try, uh, and my girlfriend as well. So uh, they will let me know if, if it's a good enough, because I can think it's okay, but it's good to know what other people think about your products, because you're deep into the matter, and and you maybe you don't want to drown in your own uh, ideas. So you have to get some feedback from other people, and also the customers as well. Yeah, they uh, they will tell me if there's an issue or whatever. Yeah, so. Is there any average time from the first sample to when you you decided to put it on the market, more or less, to get to the final result? Yeah, that, that depends actually. Um, uh, I recently, I just developed my recipes and I can tweak them to new flavors very easily. And maybe it's like, one or two samples making a ganache or a jandia or a fruit gel and then I'm, I hit the spot and I think it's okay. So when you do it over and over and you, you, you constantly know what's happening inside, like the sugar content and the, the, uh, the fat content of milk fat or cocoa butter and the solids and uh, the water content, of course, you, uh, there's a certain window where you have to operate for uh, your, your freshness and um, workability and also the flavor. So when you do that a lot of times, you, 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 you just see and you feel the ganache actually, yeah. Yeah, before, before you said uh, that uh, you, you give uh, some beans, uh, some nibs uh, to, to your customer. And uh, in uh, 2016, you discovered mm -hmm. that, that chocolate uh, was not um, uh, falling down in a bag uh, uh, from the, the chocolate tree, but there is the cocoa tree, and so you, you understand anything. How do you explain to your customers the differences between the chocolate they could find uh, in a supermarket and the chocolate you make? and uh, more, I think, uh, complicated. How uh, do you explain the difference between the chocolate that uh, you are using in your pralines and uh, uh, the, the, the pralines of the other chocolatiers that I know in the Netherlands uh, there are a lot of, uh, of chocolatiers that make pralines. So in which way you explain uh, uh, over the, the, the sample of the cocoa beans that you are different than the others? Well, I just try to uh, make clear that I know where my, exactly where it comes from and uh, what the ideas uh, are uh, when it's made, uh, which small corporation or which farmers are involved and, and just knowing a lot about the background, where it comes from. And uh, yeah, I try, just try to, under, to to tell that story and uh, I think that's really important because there's so much um, things not going all right within the cocoa industry still today and uh, maybe it will change by uh, well me making my own pralines and knowing where everything is coming from um, and I actually the, the, the chefs of like the better restaurants you know they, they also they they, they go into the forest and they pick their own mushrooms and their own herbs and, and they know everything where everything is coming from or they have some small farmer here in the Beemster in Holland and that the farmer produces their vegetables so and they still work with the industrial product so I think that's that's quite weird they sh yeah they, they must be educated as well and, and know where cocoa comes from and it's also possible to tell that story uh, within the restaurant business. Yeah, because it just doesn't happen too much or actually not at all, I think. Yeah, and uh, again uh, about uh, the cocoa beans, uh, do you have some connection directly with the farmers? Uh, um, do you have different origins or uh, no? No, I don't have, uh, I, I, I get it through a middleman here in, uh, in Amsterdam 
uh, is uh, crafting markets and he uh, he imports uh, directly from the several origins. Um, also Darren Hauer here in uh, Zaandam. And uh, I'm busy with uh, on common cacao trying to uh, look for their oranges as well. So I think they they control that process because it's a different step because um, yeah you can import it directly but I think it's not profitable for me because it has to be go uh, has to go in a container to, to keep the transport cost low because yeah. if you do it by yeah. airplane it's gonna be way out of hand and uh, so actually it's, it's a, a process I don't want to think about too much because it's too much specialized uh, knowledge involved as well. Yeah. So uh, even if you don't have a direct contact with the with the farmers, how do you see the relationship, the business relationship between uh, the big companies like Danauer or the Trader, and uh, the farmers, and which benefits the bean to bar chocolate movement can bring to the relation these relationships with the uh, with the farmers. Uh, I think uh, they they can teach me as well and uh, teach the farmers as well because um, especially also in America like Dandelion these guys they they uh, know a lot about uh, the fermentation process as well and uh, they, they they mingle in as well with these uh, farmers and I think it's good to um, educate some farmers in how to treat the cocoa because of the needs of the chocolate makers. And I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, lot to gain in there as well. Yeah. Okay, and which is your uh, main market? Do you sell also abroad or on, only locally? You have uh, some dealers, uh, some exporters, how is it? Directly to restaurants and catering companies and have a small website. And I do some web orders, just uh, the small boxes by mail. And that's where I start. And um, yeah, and also like for companies, personalized boxes with my bean to buy chocolates inside. And uh, and that's where I start from now. And yeah, who knows what's uh, what's next. The bean to bar, uh, like the, the, ta the tablets, that's my next step. But it's a different process again. So I want to dive into it. First, I want to set up my praline process, uh, just uh, just very good, and then uh, I start moving to the bean to bar. Yeah, I definitely will do that because it's still it's different and it's uh, really interesting as well. And it's a different market because it's more yeah. for like shops or and uh, yeah, it's it's less less fragile as well because pralines are quite fragile because yeah. of uh, freshness, but also for shipping and. Uh, uh, let's talk uh, a, a little about technology. Okay, now you know the process because you start from the bean. So, do you think there is a, one of the of the step on the process that are more important than the other? And uh, how helpful is uh, technology for a small chocolate maker? Um, yeah, well, I think it, it all connects actually. All the, the steps in the whole process connects actually quite well. It, it's, it's, it's the roasting and, and how much you can roast depends on how much you can winnow and crack and, and, and how much you can winnow and crack and that will, uh, will fit your melange as well and your tempering and your storage. So uh, that's not a really favorite part for me uh, or most important machine but it, it, it's all important uh, in the whole process yeah but uh, the tempering machine is yeah it's it's, it's a crucial process within uh, the, the whole chain actually yeah but it's all so just we have quite finished it and the, the last question we, we do always is uh, how do you see your company in the 2030 mm -hmm. and uh, how do you see the chocolate uh, market uh, if uh, the, the bean to bar uh, chocolate makers could change uh, uh, the market or uh, not? They are arrived at the, at the top uh, and uh, the market could not change more. In 2013, so that's like eight years uh, to go. I hope that um, 
being as a chef and have a lot of uh, passionate feelings about the, the whole catering business and the restaurant business, I really would like to see that they will embrace the, the bean to bar and or the, the craft chocolate within their restaurants and hotels. And, and I think that will boost the whole industry uh, because it, I think it's still just little used and there's a world to win. And I think that will, um, they will uh, be able to tell that to their customers and, and a lot of people will understand what, what chocolate is because it's still in the shadow of uh, a lot of things and, and it, sh it shouldn't be because it's, uh, it's a really beautiful product. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, and um, just to understand better, you think that the bean to bar will grow or uh, or not? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it will. I think it will, but slowly, I think. Um, mm -hmm. it, it will never go away again uh, because it's too interesting as well, and especially as a chocolate maker. It's a really not fun process as well to make your own chocolate, and it's, a, it's, a, it's like a mesmerizing process to see the change of, uh, of of the cocoa bean, which is a hard and uh, tough product, and it will turn into a, like a, a fluid, and, and it's a, it's unbelievable. And the flavors and the aromas, it's it's so diverse. So, it slowly, I think it will pick up, and uh, yeah, I think it it, it should. And do you think that uh, everybody, like us, as a consumers? We are going to change our approach to chocolate in general due to the cho the bean to bar, or um, maybe. Um, but I think the culture of chocolate is it's been around for years and years and years, and it's it's made so available and so cheap. So I think it's really hard to um, try and to get. The most people uh, just pay that a bit of extra for for craft chocolate um, because they used it. it it's a it's a cheap product, but it shouldn't be that cheap because someone is paying the price, and okay. that's for sure. It's a, it's it's so uh, eventually it will, but I think it's more, uh, more for people with uh, a deeper interest in in people. Where does it come from? Or more interested in food and specialty foods probably. My, my belief is that it's true that it's more expensive than being to buy chocolate, but I also think that everybody does have 10 euros in the pocket, you know, so I could buy anyway a bean to bar bar, a bean to bar chocolate piece of pralines or whatever product. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That, that's definitely, definitely true. Um, but uh, I think the, the thing with the industrial chocolate is it's, it's so available and it's, uh, like all the, the small the stickers and everything, it's it's worked in every corner of the food industry, and it, it's it's it, people need to see that it's it can also be a different product. And if you have yeah, a like bean exactly. bar bar, <laughs> you you just don't munch it away. You can you just taste it. You don't eat it. You taste it, and and yeah. then yeah. you really get the flavors. And I, I think that's the story needs to be told. Yeah, yeah. it's like a good wine. Uh, exactly. I think it is uh, another kind of food. Uh, the name is always the same. The ingredients are quite the same, and uh, the flavor it is uh, the difference. So, uh, a kind of people that could appreciate it, they will go. Uh, kind of people that want to see exactly what they are eating, they can go on to eat the, the bean to bar. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you uh, very much for being on the show and uh, good luck, guys. And probably see you next time live on Chicago again. Uh, yeah. Hope so. Yeah, uh, hope so yeah. too. It is time. Okay. Thank you. Thank bye. you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Ciao. Bye.